Okay, it looks like most people are in, so we'll get going. On behalf of Bryant's Alumni Association, welcome to our next career webinar series, Leading Teams Through Crisis. Before I turn the program over to our presenters, Lori and Mike, I wanted to provide you with some tips for today's webinar, which will last for one hour. All participants will be muted. However, we do encourage you to comment and ask questions using the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. Now, we're joined today by two faculty members from Bryant's Department of Management who really need no introduction to any graduates who were fortunate enough to have them in class. Both Mike and Lori have received the Alumni Association's Distinguished Faculty Award for their dedication to students and their expertise in the field of management. Lori Coakley has been a campus trailblazer for women in leadership at Bryant. She regularly teaches design thinking, personal branding, negotiation, and leadership skills. And thanks to her extensive network of business leaders, Lori is both a role model and a mentor to our students. Mike Roberto is the trustee professor of management and the director of the Center for Program Innovation at Bryant University. Mike has published his newest book, Unlo Unlocking Creativity, just last year, and is also known for his very popular class lectures. At Bryant, he teaches classes on leadership, managerial decision-making, and business strategy. Now I'll turn the program over to Lori and Mike. Thanks, Jess, and hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and I guess good morning to some folks who are out on the West Coast, but we're so excited to get to spend a little time with you virtually. I know many of us are, are working from home or in quarantine, but we wanted to be able to share a few thoughts on leading teams through this crisis. And we've put together a, a set of six questions that we think the most effective leaders should be asking, uh, not only during the current crisis, but in the months ahead as we begin to return to whatever the new normal will be. And so let's, uh, let's dive in and take a look at some of these well, I can't advance <laughs> my screen for some reason. Um, okay, this was all working really well right before we started. And I'm seem like I'm locked. I'm like locked. Something happened when you went to share? I, you know, I'm going to try to stop share and try that again. I'm not sure what happened. I apologize, everybody. I hate it when things work so perfectly in the all right up until the moment. All right, let's try now, see if this works. All right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right, so what we thought we'd do is start, before we introduce these six questions that we're gonna be talking with you today, is to ask you a little bit about your own experience uh, over the last six to eight weeks. And so we have a poll that's gonna pop up on your screen. We're gonna give people about 30 seconds to respond, um, and then we'll show you the results for what our alumni think so far about their organization's response to the current crisis. And we will, we'll, as we tabulate here, we've got almost everybody has responded. So in about 10 seconds here, we're gonna go ahead and share these results with you. And you in your chat window, we welcome you to offer some commentary on, on why you responded as you did. What are some of the best things you've seen your leaders do and, and what are some of the more ineffective things that you've seen them do? Let's go ahead, Jess, and end the polling and, and share the results for everybody. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, that you know, an overwhelming um, uh, a number of you, an overwhelming majority think that it's either good or excellent. Really only a handful of people that have said that their organizations handled it ineffectively. So love to see you maybe offer a few thoughts on chat and begin the discussion of what you think has worked well and maybe hasn't worked as well as we begin to walk through these six key questions. So we're gonna go ahead and stop sharing these results here right now and then move on to some of these questions that we wanted to tee up with you. Yeah, and ever, somehow every time Jess takes over, it locks my computer. <laughs> um, uh -oh. Sorry, everybody. This is because two of us are trying to host, and it keeps doing that. All right. All right, so six key questions. The first one might surprise you. What should we not be doing? And we'll explain what that means, but we think this is actually a very, very important question that in fact, has been answered pretty well during the crisis, but will become hard to answer 
moving forward, but it's a question you have to be asking. And then a couple of important questions that you can ask your team members around, what am I missing and how can we help you? And then we'll also talk about uh, something that Lori calls touch points. And she'll be asking and talking to you about the question, how are you doing? And then how do we preserve the culture? You know, our organizations are gonna have to make a lot, already making a lot of tough decisions, including furloughs and cost cuts and shutting down key programs and initiatives. And a real question around, how do we preserve the culture, the best of what we are and the values that we have while we have to make those kind of tough decisions? And then finally, we won't return to the old normal. It'll be a new normal. And so that means it'll be a new customer experience for our clients and our customers. And the question will be, what are the pain points in that customer experience? And how do we alleviate those, right? This is gonna be a different customer experience with its own frustrations for our clients and customers. And the best firms are the ones who identify what the pain points or points of friction are for customers in that new experience and really optimize it. So we'll talk about that. Let's start with the question of what we should not be doing. I wanna tell you a story about Herb Kelleher, who died recently, He's the founder and longtime CEO at Southwest Airlines. Now Southwest, as some of you know, I like to talk about because they're such a unique company in so many ways. Perhaps the most unique thing about them is that until this year, and we don't know what will happen, probably this will be the first time they actually operate with a loss in 50 years. And this is an era where every other major uh, national airline in the United States has gone bankrupt. Uh, some of them have reorganized out of Chapter 11, many of them don't even exist anymore. And Southwest, year after year, through recession or growth, has always turned a profit. They're a remarkable firm. And Herb always said he could boil the strategy and the vision down to something very simple. He said, we are the low cost carrier. That's it, that's our strategy. And there's a great story that's told about an employee who had been doing some customer research and doing some surveys with customers. And based on that feedback, and this was around the time Southwest was beginning to introduce some longer routes, even cross country routes. Uh, and as a result, people are in that plane now for five or six hours. And the issue was, do we need to start offering food, more food than we do currently? And they'd done some research and they tested some different options. And one of the things they were looking at introducing was chicken salad sandwiches that had tested well with uh, customers. And uh, Herb Kelleher said to this manager who was doing this customer research, will serving chicken salad sandwiches on that route contribute to our goal to be the low cost carrier, the low cost carrier in the United States? If the answer is no, he said, then we don't need no damn chicken salad sandwiches, <laughs> right? total focus what should we not be doing that's not our business we don't offer first class we don't offer business class we don't serve meals right you know the story at southwest right now it turns out during the crisis this has been really important being able to set priorities and shed all the things that aren't that important right and so this is a great quote from a management consultant who talks about his own teams and he says i am focusing my teams on the few things that truly matter to get through this outbreak, which are the same things that determine the success of the company in the best of times, right? Really identifying what are the true handful of things we must do, we have to do, that are most important. Now, it turns out during the crisis, we've been really good at setting priorities. Everybody has gone, okay, this is what really matters, this is what we have to focus on, and it's been very easy to push items off the agenda that just aren't that important or that urgent. But wait till we come out of it and things return to some semblance of normalcy, what will happen? Will it be as easy to set priorities and to say, no, we're not gonna do that because that's not as important or urgent? I would argue it's gonna be much more difficult. We'll go back to the old way of doing things. Politics will reemerge. People will lobby and push for their pet project and it'll be difficult, more difficult to focus. But focus wins in the marketplace. And the best firms, even the best of times, did what Southwest did and really understood what they were, who they were, and what they didn't do. And so I think this is gonna be important, asking this question, what should we not be doing, even going forward out of the crisis? What's really important to fulfilling our mission? I would encourage you all to ask that. The second question is, what am I missing? And here the underlying premise is that, especially in this time, all of this uncertainty and ambiguity, very unpredictable future. 
as an executive this morning told me, I was on a, a Zoom with a group of C-suite executives from around the world, some of the largest companies in the Fortune 500. And one of them said, look, you know what I told my people? I've never been through a pandemic either. I don't have all the answers. And how important is that, right? As a leader to go, okay, I don't know everything. We are in totally unprecedented times. So the question to ask of your people is, what am I missing, right? I want to hear from you. What are you seeing out there? I'm not an expert in this. I need your help. And being able to create an environment where you're inviting people to the conversation. You know, it, it's one thing when we're operating in stable times where we're doing things we've been doing for decades. Okay, maybe then, you know, your knowledge as the expert in the room, as the leader, is superior to that of others in the room. But when you're dealing with something we've never dealt with before, the willingness to say to your team, I don't know everything. What am I missing will be really important. And, you know, Google, even during good times, found that this was really important. They conducted a study a couple of years ago called Project Aristotle, led by Julia Rosowski, pictured here. And what she did was study over 150 teams throughout Google, some in sales, others in product development and engineering. And they basically ranked these teams from the highest performing teams to the lowest performing teams. And then they went out and tried to figure out what is it that distinguishes the highest performing teams from the lowest. And what they discovered is who was on the team, the talent level of the people actually didn't matter as much as the kind of culture that was created within the team and the way it was led. That this actually trumped talent, right? And five things stood out in Julia's research. The first and most important was, did the leaders establish an environment where people could speak candidly? An environment of what Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School calls psychological safety. And Amy and I have found this in a lot of the work we've done, whether it's research on NASA or on uh, hospitals or on other kinds of businesses, that the building this safe environment where people are willing to share bad news, uh, talk about risks and failures, express dissenting views is so important. And so, what am I missing is basically a way to make it safe for your people to come forward, right? Oh, okay, the boss is not saying they know everything and they want my help. They're encouraging me to actually tell them what, they, what I know, right? And maybe that's not always good news, right? So what am I missing is a really important question to build that psychological safety, build that climate of candor. And you see there the other five key things. And um, I'll just point out on number three how important that's going to be in this time of crisis too. Providing structure and clarity for your teams. What exactly are people's roles, right? A little bit during the crisis, everybody's kind of been all hands on deck to just get things done. But as we return to a new normalcy, there'll be a little bit of back to clarity about what people's roles that will, that will be involved. But first and foremost, creating that environment of candor and what am I missing is a good question to help us do that. You know, psychological safety is this belief that you're not going to be marginalized or penalized for speaking up. And by speaking up, I mean whether it's new ideas or questions or it's disclosing a problem or a mistake in the organization or sharing bad news. Um, building that environment where people feel like they can be candid, and it's very difficult to do. People have a natural tendency to sort of self-censor, right? To basically go, I'm not really sure I want to stick my neck out on this issue because I don't have it all figured out. And the worst thing you can say to your people is, don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions. You probably have all worked for a boss who said that. Or maybe, uh, you know, they've said, don't tell me about the flood, build me an ark, a reference to Noah's ark the story in the Bible, right? Don't tell your people that. What you're basically telling them when you say that is, you know what, if you don't have it all figured out, I don't wanna hear about it. Oh great, so what you're telling them is sweep all the problems under the rug, hide them from leadership, uh, you know, until, and oh, by the way, if they don't figure it out and the thing mushrooms and grows, by the time you find out as leaders in the organization, you could have a massive failure on your hands. So you don't wanna do that, right? You want them to come forward proactively. That's very important. Krista Quarles runs a company called Open Table. Back when we used to go to restaurants, uh, we love to use this, this smartphone app that her company has to make restaurant reservations. And really useful, especially when you're traveling, you're a city that, where you don't live. Normally you hop on, you, you check out ratings, you make a reservation. Very, very smooth, efficient process. And she has this great quote she talks about with regard to encouraging her people to come forward. She said, 
early, often, and ugly. It's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect, your idea, because we can course correct much, much sooner if you come forward. No amount of ugly truth, she said, scares me. It's just information to make a decision. And you know, this is important though to think about because a couple of years ago, I had a chance to interview Ed Catmull, who was the CEO of Disney, all of Disney animation. Before that, he ran Pixar for Steve Jobs. Then he ran all of Disney animation when Disney acquired Pixar. And Catmull talks about the key to innovation is ugly babies. He said, you know, if you get your ugly baby out there, your idea out there when it's still a little rough, it's a little ugly, early with your team, you can make it better together. The problem, he said, is so many people don't want to show anyone their baby until they think everyone is going to definitely say their baby's the most beautiful in the world. So they wait to tell leadership about their ideas till they think they have them perfected. And the problem with that is two problems. One is that's really slow. That means they're working for months on an idea before they share it and get any feedback. And the second is when they do bring it to the boss at that point, if the boss doesn't like it, they've crushed the soul of the employee because they've worked for so long on the idea, they've fallen in love with their baby at that point. And now they're getting negative feedback. So very, very challenging. So early, often, and ugly, says Krista Quarles. And so one way to, how, do you, how does this become reality? What does this actually look like for leaders uh, dealing with really high stakes, really difficult, very unpredictable situations? Well, Gary Klein, is someone who's worked closely with the U.S. military, with doctors and nurses, with firefighters, with other kinds of people who've worked in high-stress situations over now three decades of work. And Gary came up with this methodology um, with military commanders that I really love. It's called the stick method. Okay, and here's what he teaches military leaders to do when they work with their teams. He says, you start by saying, Here's what I think we face. In other words, here's my assessment of our situation, or of the problem we have. Then the task. Here's what I think we should do. Not here's what we're going to do. Here's what I think we should do, right? Phrasing is important. The third is my intent. Why do I think this is what we should do? What's my rationale? Let people into your head a little bit so they're not just ordering them to do something, but you're explaining why you want them to do it. The why matters, Gary Art. The fourth is, here's what we should keep our eye on. This is what's concerning me. And if this changes or this unfolds in a way I don't anticipate, we could be in a whole new situation. So this is what we want to keep our eye on. This is where our plan might not be unfolding the way we thought it did. As, you know, as Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a strategy until I punch them in the mouth, right? This is the, where's the punch going to come from? Let's think about it a little bit. And then lastly, calibrate. This is the most important one. This is telling your team, now talk to me. Tell me if you don't understand, if you don't think we can do this, or if you see something that I don't. This is the what am I missing question that you lay out, built into a pretty rigorous methodology, a very disciplined one that the military leaders use based on Klein's work. And I'm gonna encourage you to think about this. It can be useful for you. What am I missing? The last part of the stick method. Okay. Third question before I turn it over to Lori is how can we help you? And here we have two of my favorite leaders, Julie Morath, who I met 18 years ago when she was the chief operating officer at Children's Hospital and Clinics in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And she led an effort to reduce medical accidents at that hospital and did a remarkable job by getting people to be willing to talk about errors, right, rather than sweep them under the rug, and then to work hard at figuring out how to eliminate or prevent those errors moving forward. And she did a remarkable job such that she became CEO of the Hospital Quality Institute, working with hospitals and clinics throughout the country, try to focus on reducing medical errors. The time she started this quest 20 years ago, it was the third highest cause of death in the United States was medical accidents. And she was on a, uh, really a crusade to reduce that. And then on, on the left there is Alan Mulally, who Lori and I have uh, looked at and examined for years, uh, he was the man who executed the turnaround at Ford Motor Company without a bailout of taxpayers and without a Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in the last Great Recession. And Mullally uh, came to Ford and he started these weekly meetings uh, in the Thunderbird room at Ford corporate headquarters with his senior team. And what he asked his team to do was to uh, create color-coded charts that would track progress on key metrics and key initiatives that were part of the Ford turnaround plan when he got there. He was an outsider who came in. 
and he asked everyone to code their charts, green, yellow, or red. Green, everything was going great. Yellow, there was generally good, but a few caution notes. And red, this was something that was off track. We weren't gonna make schedule or budget. We weren't gonna achieve our goals if we kept going the way we were going. And he started holding these weekly meetings. And that year that he got there, he got there in the middle of the year, uh, Ford was on track to lose $17 billion. And he goes to the weekly meetings and he stops the meeting after a few weeks and he says to the team, you know, it's interesting, we're going to lose $17 billion this year and all the charts are green. Is there anything that's not going well here? And he said, the room got silent. And then a couple weeks later, someone was brave enough to put up the first red chart. And in this video clip I'm going to show you, you'll see what happens next. Let's take a listen. What, what's this leader going to do? And so the next, uh, two weeks later, um, Mark Fields, who's the, the leader of all the America's business, Canada, uh, the United States and South America, had an edge launch in Oakville, Canada, and they had an actuator issue on the tailgate. So he stopped production because we're going to be best in class. We're not going to deliver one vehicle unless it's done and, it, and, it's, and it's the best in quality. So he had like two or 3,000 edges, you know, sitting out on the tundra. Thank God it was cold so they weren't sinking in because when you stop production, I mean, I mean, it's a big deal. Uh, and so up comes his chart for the launch of this new edge and it's bright red. And I mean, you, it got so quiet. I, I, you know what they're all thinking. It's over. Mark's gone, gone. He's out of here. And then what's this new guy going to do? So I started to clap. Now they knew that was a sign. The door was going to open. Somebody's going to come in. Mark's out of here. <laughs> I could just, I could just feel it. I mean, it just, and, and I said, Mark, is there anything that we can do to help you with that? And before Mark could say one word, Benny Fowler, who is the head of quality now worldwide said, Mark, I think I've seen that issue on a launch that we did six months ago. Cause you know, in the car business, you have so much product coming out. I mean, it's what's so, so exciting. Um, and then Joe Hendricks, at the time, he's the leader of all Asia Pacific now, was the head of a manufacturing. He said, you're going to need some manufacturing engineers because as soon as you find that problem and fix it, you're going to have to change all those vehicles and get the production going again. I'll have, those, I'll have, I'll have the, our dynamite talent up in Canada immediately. And then uh, Derek Kuzak, who leads product development worldwide, uh, says, Mark, I've seen that technical issue on such and such five years ago or something. I'll get right on that. That exchange took 12 seconds. 12 seconds. We went on to the next chart. Of course, it was green. <laughs> One of the next chart, it's green. Um, the next week, I think it was still red. Mark's chart, everything else was green. Next week, I think he changed it to yellow because they found a solution and now they're implementing it. I think the next week, it turned to green. And boom, all the vehicles started going. And then probably the, one of the most exciting days of my life, both from a, oh shit. I mean, uh, this is a terrible situation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, to, uh, my gosh, we're going to make it, was the following week. And guess what the charts look like? They look like a rainbow. <laughs> like a rainbow. And I'm, I'm going, Oh my. Oh my God. Right. And so it's interesting. Uh, um, I think that, you know, we all know the bosses who shoot the messenger. Right. And so what Mullally does, he clearly doesn't shoot the messenger. But, you know, a lot of leaders do something that's not quite as bad as shoot the messenger, but they, they launch the interrogation when somebody comes forward with this kind of a thing. And so he doesn't do that either. He doesn't say, what's the problem? What's the cause? How are you going to fix it? He says, how can we help you? Right. And he launches in the team into this very collaborative problem solving mode and they get to an answer. I, yeah, I, I often have used this video and I used it a few months ago before the crisis with a group of executives out in the Midwest and someone said, you know, professor, we tried this in our company and we didn't get any red charts. And I said, wow, you know, I, I wonder why. And he said, oh no, we fixed it. We added a fourth color. So they said we went green, yellow, orange, and red. And suddenly we got a lot of orange charts. 
it, there was so much fear in the organization of admitting a mistake that even with all the things Malali had done, they tried to replicate, people still wouldn't put a red chart up. So they nuanced it a little. Okay, it's not red, it's not totally awful, it's orange. And they got people to come forward. So whatever it takes, right, to be able to get people to follow, to get over that hurdle is so important. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lori because there's a really important now follow-up question that has to come uh, after you do this that she's gonna talk about. Absolutely, thanks Mike. So. You know, it is important to ask, how can I help you? And it's important to know what information you're missing. And it's important to know what we shouldn't be doing. But from my standpoint, one of the best things you can also ask is your people. How are you doing? And one of my favorites who is paramount in using this technique to the success of his former company is Doug, Con Doug Conant. And one of the things I love is the fact that this is someone who, you know, he took over this company in 2001 total crisis, right? I mean, it was, um, they had lost like half their value in the year 2000. The U.S. Um, soup industry was just in a disarray. We looked at a situation in which um, R&D expenses have been totally cut. Um, they were looking at big price gaps, if you can imagine, with all of the private brands coming in selling soup now. Um, and for him, probably one of the hardest issues to wrestle with was the fact that there also had been a series of layoffs. A lot of people were nervous about their job. And so when he walked through the gate, which he described as going like walking into a prison, he's handed the situation in which they've got a lot of things to fix in order to kind of regain not just the confidence of the consumer, but the confidence of the people working. He knew he needed 20,000 people to embrace kind of a new way of doing business. And the best way for him to do that is to focus on what he calls action is in the interaction. In other words, it takes working with people to make change happen. He said, it's great to have the financials, you need to really be tough on those issues, but you have to ask people, how are you doing? You have to recognize the importance that they play in the change process, in moving through this crisis. Um, he talks about this idea of touch points, which is really walking through and spending a moment asking people, how are you doing? And those, actions, those multiple interactions are what lead and yield to success. You're trying to build that credibility. If you don't have an environment, as Mike was saying, where people feel like they can come and, and tell you that there's a problem, you'll never be able to turn things around. And so I want to share with you a short clip. It's actually a short two clips in which he talks about this idea of not only is action in the interaction, but that while you have to be tough-minded on the issues and we, and we need to be the tough CEO and we need to make those decisions, you've got to be tender-hearted on the people if you expect to weather the crisis. Mike will launch that. Mike's not paying attention to me now. No, no, I am. But again, <laughs> every not time it's, oh. yeah, so it's just whenever we switch. I was going to say he's seen it too often. <laughs> Mm, I didn't like it. Didn't like it this time. Likes my talking, but not my video. Yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> Sorry. Leadership. I like to say, the action is in the interaction. We all have strategies, we all have values, we all have plans. It's how you bring them to life in the moment with others that defines your reputation as a leader. If you're effective in the moment with others, you understand the issue, you see the other people, you provide a leadership perspective, you help advance the notion, you will succeed. If you're ineffective in the moment, you will fail. In essence, it is that simple. It is not complicated. The action is in the interaction. You have to perform. If you want to have an opportunity, you have to deliver. You have to meet or exceed the standards of the job. If you want to be a CEO, you have to have superior financial performance. You have no choice. At the same time, our belief is that that is woefully inadequate. At the same time, we believe great leaders have to be tough-minded on the issues and tender-hearted with the people. Because you quickly realize 
that they're making all the decisions when you're not in the room. They have to be fully engaged in the efforts of the enterprise. And we believe that you can't ask them to devote meaningful, intense energy to, and effort to the work unless they believe that you are personally invested in them as human beings. In my experience, it just will not work any other way. So if you want to enroll them in the enterprise, you need to be tender-hearted. You need to be personally committed to their well-being. As you evidence that commitment, I guarantee you they will evidence a clear commitment to your enterprise. Tough-minded on the issue, tender-hearted with people. It's not either or, it's all about both. Stealing words from Jim Collins, it's all about the genius of the ant. Tough-minded on the issue and tender-hearted with the people. Bringing that genius of the ant to life at Campbell's, we have a simple success model. It's very much like a shared value model you might have seen or a triple bottom line concept. We've been doing this. All right, so what became really important to driving success in that turnaround was not just the financials, and they did all the financials, and, and you know they, they put money into R&D, and they, they came up with better cost-cutting measures and higher quality. But more importantly, what they did was turn around engagement. When Doug Condit took over Campbell Food, every two employees were engaged to every one who was disengaged. Um, it was pretty dismal. And he says, you couldn't walk the halls without anybody ever even looking at you or smiling. And, um, and he said, we need, to, we need these people on board. We cannot change what we want to do unless everybody is aligned with this new vision and this change of what we want to implement. And so he said, we need to give them what we call the Campbell promise. And what he did is Campbell promises to value its people and its people will value Campbell. And what he meant was we have to show them in a very tangible way, demonstrate that every single employee is important to this business. And in turn, we trust that they will then help us work towards achieving our corporate strategy. And it worked for Campbell. And one of the things that they ended up doing besides increasing um, a lot of diversity in the company and having some active listening sessions are these three different points that I wanna share. And one was declare yourself and declare yourself started with that promise. And he was really, it was, he said, if you're going to declare, if you're going to say something that you're going to do, you actually have to follow through and do it. You have to be intentional. You made a promise, have some integrity, follow through. If our promise is to value people, right, then we need to create a different environment. And so they changed and upgraded the facilities at Campbell so that it was more amenable for working. Um, they actually changed their leadership. They had a whole staffing philosophy change in which they actually, their 350 top leaders left, they kept 150, they lost about 150, but then we took 150 and moved them up in the organization. So he was really a strong believer in whatever you state you're going to do, follow through, make it known, people can't read your mind, but make it known and do it. The second thing that I share with my students all the time is this idea of the handwritten note. And one of the things you have to do is people who, especially if you work in a big company, think that their efforts go unnoticed and that they're just one of 20,000. And so one of the things that Doug Conant really did is focused on this idea that if you write a note, it doesn't have to be long, a few lines that are directed towards a specific person about a specific action they took, whether it was just an act of kindness, whether it was helping a customer who was being difficult, Whatever it might be, he would solicit from all of his top management team, give me some news from the day, you know, tell me something good, as my friend Allison likes to say. And when you focus on that, he would write a note to them, and he said, you didn't understand the impact, and still he, he started traveling around to the different locations for Campbell Foods, and his notes would be up everywhere. So a small card, a, a handwritten note that showed that it was personal about an intent. He said, went a long way to increasing morale and creating that environment that recognized that the people were valued. The third point he made was this idea of a touch point, like I mentioned earlier. And in a touch point, you're really just taking one or two moments during the course of a day to stop and ask, how are you doing? All right, how's family? How are we operating? What could we be doing differently? He says, we have a tendency, and especially in a crisis situation, to kind of go back into that back office and work on our strategies and figure our way out of this. And when people interrupt us, we look at them with disdain on us. We, we close them off. We don't create an environment that we want to hear from them. And to echo back to what Mike said, you have to create that kind of environment where people feel like they can bring you a problem 
so that you can actually move forward. Um, as soon as you don't, you don't build that credibility and you don't have that confidence. And so creating these touch points, you said three a day, turn into 21 a week, turn into a thousand over the course of a year, but make an impact shows that action or, you know, action is in that interaction. Um, I'd like to show an example, um, a personal example. I'm gonna have you change the slide, Mike. And, um, and this is underscoring the need to create the environment, not just now, but as you're moving forward. If you haven't done it now, it, it gives you a focus to where to put your energies. By creating an environment in which you really get to know your people, then when crisis does happen, there's that credibility. So in 1975, April of 1975, um, former Rear Admiral, retired Rear Admiral Eustick, was actually Captain of the USS Reasoner. And they had just, they'd been on an eight month cruise, an eight month deployment, they were out in the Asia Pacific. Um, he really focused on and shared with me that you have to spend hours knowing your crew, knowing people individually in groups. If you don't, they don't come to you anymore and you've lost them. You've lost their confidence and their belief that you don't care. And this is paramount in many situations, but it was really driven home in the situation he was about to face. Of all people, Henry Kissinger calls the ship and says, I, we'll get your orders in a moment, but you've got to turn around. And so they were in, there were 12 of them in the squadron that were, had been together for the last eight months. Nine got to go home. They got to go back to their families. Three were asked to be what they called the guard ships for five cruisers and two carriers that were being sent back to what they call the mouth of the lion. They were being sent back to Vietnam. It was April, end of April, 1975, to help with the evacuation. It had just become overwhelming in Saigon and they needed to go back and help these people. And so Captain Eustick realized that now he had to tell all of these, these this whole crew that they, who thought they were going home, that no, we need you for another eight months and we need you for something important. He could not have delivered that message in a credible way had he already not built this relationship with his crew. Um, and what he ended up doing that um, was again, believable because of those actions, that interaction that he had conveyed was he basically told them, look at, you know, we're gonna be the marquee ship. All right, the hallmark ship. And he says, you know, when you care enough, you have to send in the very best, and we're the very best. And to echo a sentiment by Teddy Roosevelt, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you want success in turning things around, you have to demonstrate this repeatedly. We're gonna go to the next slide, Mike. Thank you. We are gonna launch our second poll, right? Yep. And so what we wanna know is, how has your company created touch points to date um, during this crisis? How often are they doing it? Especially we want to consider how in a remote situation this happens. Um, because most of us, like me, are working from home. And you can, if you want, you can use the chat to talk about how you've done it. What are some of the mechanisms you've used to create these touch points with your employees during the crisis? Mm -hmm. And while that's happening, yeah. uh, you know, I'll just really quick say, Lori, I gave a webinar uh, a week ago or so to a major real estate firm in Boston. And they must have read either your stuff or Conant's mm -hmm. stuff directly because I got over the course of the last week in the mail every day, I've gotten four or five thank you notes. <laughs> so I have like 25, and these are not like two word thank you notes, but extensive thank you notes uh, talking about the talk. And I was like, wow, no wonder they're one of the most successful real estate firms. They know how to build relationships. Well, I think it's interesting because Doug Conant talks about the fact that he didn't in his 25 uh, year career ever receive one. Or he said, wow. if he did, it was maybe like one or two. But even faculty, if you go around offices, I love to put mine up because especially when you feel like you've had a terrible day, you've done a terrible job, it's good to know people still love you. So you can go and read your thank you notes. That's right. Hey, there we go. So uh, right. again, the companies look like they're doing pretty well, Lori. I know it looks like we have, you know, over half are, are doing off. And so it'll be interesting when we get to some Q&A to hear and look at some other ways to do this. But it becomes important to have those touch points and to be able to create a culture in which um, you can um, definitely manage a crisis. And one of the things about culture that I think is so important and it becomes really our next um, 
question in guiding a crisis is, is how do we preserve culture is culture is that glue that is that shared beliefs and values and norms that you have to, to pull everybody together and say we're in this together and to be able to create that environment that people trust you that they understand that you're that you're not you know that you're going to make some tough decisions even if it requires a furlough but that we're in this together and we're going to figure it out and it's important that we remember each other um one of the things that i think i've really noted here at bryant is we made a transition um, right after spring break into having to go to online teaching and what was really important is that we created opportunities for those touch points that also created and resonated with the culture of our department. So the management department meets every Wednesday on Zoom and we get to share best practices, but we also share what's not going well and where we're frustrated. And that has helped us weather what we call um, for us and what Anne Mulcahy called in her situation, the perfect storm. But I want, Mike has a great story I want him to share first with on John, Jen Tombaugh, Tombaugh, because even um, the president of a family owned um, travel company can experience the exact same things someone a CEO of Xerox can experience during a crisis. Mike? Yeah, so Jen, you know, is the first non-family member to run Talk. Talk is one of the world's largest travel tour operators. Uh, they're headquartered in Connecticut. They've been family owned since the beginning in the 1920s. And uh, you can not imagine what happened to their company. She went from giving a speech to her top couple of hundred people, uh, celebrating a banner record year and uh, with bonuses and all the like and celebrate and then two weeks later the business went to zero revenue the entire business shut down completely and she said it was the worst couple of weeks of her professional life she had to furlough a lot of people as you might imagine and she said the question on her mind that she asked every one of her uh, people was how do we preserve the culture how do we not lose all the good stuff all the values, everything we've been saying about family, and now here we are having to furlough people, how we do it um, and the way we communicate it is gonna be so important because if we don't preserve the culture, then we will not be the same firm when we come out of this and we'll, we'll never be as successful again. And so the ability to do that, and one of the things she did, she, she, and someone mentioned this in the chat, which I think is really powerful, she said it became the first, one of our first principles was over communicate, open up, and she started, uh, a daily blog and in that blog she decided very purposely not just to communicate about the business but to share something personal in, in it each day and each week to try to focus on this uh, preserving the culture so I think it's really important and of course Anne Mulcahy at Xerox faced a giant crisis as well back to you Laurie on that thank you and it's interesting because um, one of the comments that Stanley made in the chat was should we be preserving the culture you know is this the culture we want to preserve which is actually what Anne Mulcahy faced so um you know back in 2000 when she was um started to take over um, um xerox and she had it was interesting because she'd been with the company for 25 years she started in sales she moved up she was brought in as coo um, and not necessarily you know did everybody agree that this was the right course of action um, but Xerox again was a like Campbell, a company in really bad shape at that point. And when you look at it, the company was $18 billion in debt. They were losing $300 million a year. Um, they were really facing bankruptcy and the rumors were abounding right and left, which was affecting their business. No one wanted to, it was hard to start to, to secure those contracts. Everybody thought you were going to be out of business, right? And on top of that, the SEC, SEC was investigating them based on some accounting practices in their subsidiary in Mexico. So she takes over. Nobody believes she's the right one externally. Share, you know, the, the drop in price again in stock is evident of this. No one supports this. But one of the things that was really important and one of the reasons she was chosen is she was known for being very fierce and loyal to the people of Xerox. She really believed in the people of Xerox. The employees to her were number one. They were paramount, again, that engagement. But she knew with them, working with them, making the tough decisions, getting to know what the issues were, she spent three months going around and really talking to customers, talking to employees and trying to understand this was critical. But it came back to that culture and to address what Stanley says, and we'll hear from Anne in just a moment, that culture is based on a set of very firm values. And what 
she believed was a Xerox she started with had that very firm foundation of values and beliefs at their core, and she needed to get back to it. Sometimes what happens in a crisis is we lose sight of our culture and we lose sight of what's important and what drives us. And so I'm gonna have Mike um, show us a small film clip. Corporate culture, and it's kind of gotten a bad rap um, lately. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was making my initial rounds, I was visiting a big customer and a new CEO um, for a bank. And he was coming in with kind of a turnaround charter and uh, wanted to give me um, a lot of advice about what needed to be done at Xerox. And we owed him a lot of money, so I was listening. <laughs> so uh, in any case, uh, he said, you gotta kill the culture. It's the, the culture in this company that has made it you know, sluggish and bureaucratic and you've lost your, your edge and your competency. And I was listening, but I have to tell you, uh, I realized it was kind of nonsense. What is a culture other than the collection of people and behaviors that you have within a company? And it's a great way of pointing out, uh, you know, it's your problem uh, to the people of a company. And cultures clearly needed to be adapted. Ours needed to gain a lot of speed. We needed to do away with some things, but you have to bring the culture with you if you wanna get things done in a big company. And it was hugely important that we really built on the strengths of the Xerox culture to enable us to do what we had to do. And our culture puts a premium on things like quality and empowerment, results, diversity, fairness, customer, corporate responsibility, things that are really, uh, people are proud of. And uh, quite frankly, it's the reason a lot of people came to Xerox and why a lot of us stayed. So, if it helped us achieve greatness in the path, in the past, hopefully it can be a path for the future as well. The seventh has to do with focusing on uh, on customers, never forgetting the reason custom that that companies exist. But when bankers are calling and shareholders are knocking on the door, it's really sometimes easy to lose sight and forget the most important constituency of all, and that's the customer. But I have to say that we decided as a team that that would be. Um, our number one executive focus that we would own customer relationship. So we all took key clients and uh, went out and uh, really personally communicated to our key clients, solved problems, addressed issues. We've kept that program, which we call our focused exec program, but it's hugely important and it's built into the fabric of our company, but just to ensure that every single person, I'm talking the chief accountant, you name it, has responsibility for a set of customers that they visit with. And not only is it great for the customer to get the kind of um, you know, senior attention that's required, but it's great for our executive team because it provides them with that grounding principle of what our customers are thinking. And it's really been hugely helpful. Eighth is um, something I call the vision thing. And um, I guess the, the best parallel is, is that even when Rome was burning, people wanted to know what the city of the future would look like. And, I have to plead guilty that I didn't immediately get that part. Um, I would do lots of town meetings and I was always amazed that the most frequently asked question is what Xerox would look like when we came through the turnaround. And I'd be sitting saying there, why aren't they asking me, are we gonna make it? <laughs> are we gonna survive? Yet they were beyond that. They were kind of a, if we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna be dedicated and we have a passion about this, I wanna make sure that I'm working for a company that'll be a great company and not just a company that survived. It was a very good sign and certainly a, a great example of the resilience and optimism of Xerox people. But I'm not very patient, I have to say, with uh, the vision thing and vision statements and all that. So we decided to do something a little different and um, probably our biggest critic at the time and there were a lot of the ugliest headlines uh, were uh, present was in the Wall Street Journal. Every day you'd pick it up and there was some uh, horrible uh, story about Xerox. And so we decided to write a fictitious Wall Street Journal article dated in 2005 that would really describe where Xerox would be in 2005 with all of the elements, if you will, of strategy and metrics and goals and, um, and opinions and feedback. We, we had quotes from you know analysts and uh, from our toughest critics and, uh, and we basically, it forced us to kind of express, express our vision and our strategy in, in, in plain English. And, you know, we talked about everything from, you know, what technology we'd be bringing to market to what the revenue growth would look like and, um, and how we'd like to be seen. And it was incredibly useful. P people really rallied around this vision. And um, to this day, no matter where I go in Xerox, that article comes out and 
I'd say fascinatingly, 80% of it um, probably is pretty accurate. And I get asked about the other 20% all the time. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, well, when's this going to happen? And I said, like, hello, we made it up. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And uh... <laughs> So one of the things that I hope that you got from that cliff is the fact that she said we had to build our culture based on our strengths. And I think that's really important. Steve Covey says a great quote. He said, you know, we can't talk our way out of um, bad behaviors that we've created. We've got to behave our way out. And I think that it's really important to understand that you have to lead by, by example, you have to model the way, and you start by building that great culture. She also talked about um, focusing on the customer and really asking the customer. And this gets to our last question, what are the pain points in our new customer experience? And I think that that is so critically important because you know, in order, whether you're Xerox or you're IBM, to turn things around, you've got to go speak to the customers and have an idea, what are they going through? What are they concerned about? What does this new normal mean for them? Um, and I think it's especially critical um, as we try to move out of this into the, the next phase. And if you've been watching the news, I, I applaud, actually it's JetBlue that was one of the first airlines to come out and say that what we want to do is have everybody wear a mask and on the plane, every passenger, and we're not going to um, put anybody in the middle seats and we're going to clean between every flight. And there's no penalty if you have to change your flights or cancel. And part of that is then understanding how can we use these tools of design thinking to really empathize it and to determine what is it that our employee, our customers are going to need. Um, I'm going to have you flip the slide, Mike. And um, when we think about that customer experience, then what we want to do is really say, how can we frame it? Um, and we want to frame it and, and think about it differently. And in design thinking, one of the things we do is we frame it around the question of how might we. And how might we is really a way to open up possibilities and, and to think that there's lots of different ways that we can tackle this new normal for our customers, that we can understand what, what frustrates them and, and what their concerns are. And one of the best examples I found that's relevant to kind of what we were talking about, this travel industry, is they had a business perspective that a team could um, frame their biggest challenge along the following lines. How might we minimize the impact of a restricted travel on client engagement? So how is it? What, what can we do differently now? You know, how can we address what's con with their concerns? How can we, you know, allay the fears of people trying to fly and know that they have to get into a, a plane? How can we address those concerns and, and let them know that we are trying to come up with solutions that empathize with their needs and frame it in a way that makes sense as we move forward? Because it's really thinking about all the other opportunities that are out there. So I know we've taken a lot of time, but we've hopefully given you six good questions to consider. You know, what should we not be doing? Um, what am I missing? How can I help you? How are you? How are you feeling? What are you doing? How do we preserve this culture, even if we have to kind of go back to our basics of what made us great um, and what rallied around with everyone? And what are the pain points in our new customer experience? So in our last few minutes, I'd love to take an opportunity to open up any questions or comments that you might have. Thank yeah, you, Lori and Mike. Yeah, I just a uh, couple of comments going back to the touch points poll. Um, I know a couple of our um, participants were mentioning things like Slack, um, which is a great tool to stay connected, especially across the globe. Um, also, some ideas such as, you know, sharing pictures of, you know, dogs or kids <laughs> or what your new office looks like, um, you know, doing coffee virtually, yoga, happy hours. Um, love, would love to hear, especially from the alumni office, how your happy hours are, are working. Um, and specifically for questions, we did have a question earlier. Um, let's see here from Cheryl. Can you speak to MBWA when we are all in a remote work environment? Um, that's a great question, Cheryl. And I think that when you talk about MBWA, it's really creating those virtual touch points. And I think it's just, you know, it's, I have a great story about it. Um, one of my very close call, colleagues is a, um, a friend, it's the director of the Department of Mental Health for the state of Massachusetts. 
and she was having a meeting and she was just going crazy on the meeting because she, she had her agenda and she wanted to get things done. And finally, her assistant was the one, and someone brought this up, but said, you know, how about at our next meeting, um, everybody bring their, their animal or their pet or something? And she said, I can remember cringing inside thinking, oh my gosh, we don't have time for this. But in reality, it's what brought everybody together. So I think the new walking around has to be figuring out among your employees, how do you touch base with them, whether it's just an email saying, hey, here's what's going on, whether it is a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting, if you want, that says, I know that you're really dealing with some, some tough issues and, and how can I help you? What can we do? Um, whether it can be just, um, I know our Allison Butler this afternoon is having an idea um, happy hour and, and she, it's how she's gonna talk about the uh, innovation design program with all of us and we're celebrating Cinco de Mayo. But she's using it as an opportunity to walk around and ask people and, and engage them in conversation. Mike, would you add to that? I, you know, one of the things Jen Tombaugh told me is she's doing a lot more frequent uh, town hall meetings, but doing them virtually. Whereas she used to do them uh, once a month, she's moved them to once a week. So um, that, and then the other thing is encouraging, um, making sure you don't forget that the one-on-one -on -one meetings have to keep happening, yeah. you know, and, and, and making time for those. And the last one I really love is those, one of the people I was talking to, one of the executives said, he is making a point of meeting with, and I, I've always loved this, finding the under 30 year olds in the organization and doing these small group virtual gatherings with them because they often are kind of on the cutting edge of technology and social changes and trends. And so he's using that once a week, different group every week, under 30s, checking in with them, small group at lunchtime virtually. Uh, it's a pretty cool little technique uh, that you can use. And I think it's so important, Mike, because I know, um my daughter just recently started um, at a large company, and but her first day of work was virtual, and she's had none of these these check-ins. She hasn't had her manager just say, "How's it going?" or "What what are you frustrated? Or, what else do we need to do?" And you can see it mounting on her because she's not interacting daily in an office where she can go ask for help. So I think, especially if you've had new people come in, it's really important to reach out and say, "How are you doing in this environment?" One thing I heard this morning from a uh, one of the executives at General Mills is they've uh, done something where uh, every half hour meeting is 25 minutes, every hour meeting is 50 minutes, um, and no meetings can happen uh, between 12 and 12.30 so that everyone can actually eat their lunch with their family or wherever else at home. So they've, they've actually set some boundaries, given people that five or 10 minutes between meetings to gather themselves, um, and it also allows for other kinds of check-ins that can happen one-on-one. -on -one because some of these execs find themselves otherwise literally in virtual meetings back to back all day. And so break, giving yourself a few of these other things and scheduling them in works. I don't know, Jess, do we have other questions? Uh, we did, we do have a quick minute for one more. Uh, we had one from Erica. She wanted to know how leaders can maintain morale, especially, um, you know, <laughs> I, I think there, there can be public criticism, um, based on your you know the company's response and things like that so how how can leaders maintain that morale when they're faced with that criticism you know i i think the one thing you can't do is over promise right i mean it, you know it, my conversation with um uh, another alum actually just last week who was speaking to my students this issue of like you know it was a, i won't name the company but a situation where the the company's again had to shut down big chunks of operation you know and you can't you can't over promise because if you do that then you're in trouble so you've got to be very open with this is the you know we don't know and uh and 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 recognize that and i think the other thing is that you, you are going to make mistakes i think people are pretty forgiving if you're open about it and say look we've never been through anything like this before mistakes are going to be made if you if you if you own up to the mistakes uh, as opposed to stonewalling, I, I think, you know, people will be forgiving. Helps to have built that sort of reservoir of trust that Lori was talking about, I think. And I, I think it goes back to what you were saying, Mike, about you can't communicate too much. Um, but I, you know, you also have to look, when I, the companies I talked to, I mean, it took um, Amal Kehi at least four years to turn some things around. And, and Doug Connick got engagement up to 17 to one um, in 10 years. But it, it is that he would tell you it is the consistent, 
practice and you have to be consistent. So what message you're giving, how you interact, I think has to be consistent and you have to show the people that, you know, you have to show people you care, even if we know there are really tough decisions being made right now. Um, I think anybody we've spoken to who's had, especially if they've been in travel or, or hospitality industry have really, um, this has wreaked havoc on their industry and their personnel. And I think they've really had to be empathetic um, and just actively listen to them um, and let them know that, that they're there. The theme this morning with this group of execs I was talking to was um, trying to put a positive spin uh, on this was, hey, we have been more nimble, our companies, and agile in the last six weeks than we've been in years. So how do we keep that going when the crisis is over? In other words, one woman uh, worked at the BBC and she's an anchor at the BBC. And so she is with her 18 year old son, she built a studio in her basement uh, to be able to broadcast from her home on the BBC. And she said, if we try to build a new studio at the BBC, it's a year long endeavor with meetings, with budget requests, with, and my son and I did it in a weekend. And I think I look better in my basement than I did in the actual studio in London. And she was joking, but the point was, um, she says, one of the questions we've asked at the BBC is, how can we be that nimble after this is all over? Um, it's, that's kind of the upside, is look at your organization and go, what have you done well? Right. And been really agile, and how do you preserve that instead of only dwelling on the unfortunate stuff that's happened, right? So I thought that was a really interesting discussion this morning. I would say, you know, the overwhelming majority of them felt like they'd done some good things where they had been really agile, and, and they wanted to preserve that going forward. Great, thank you. And I know there were some additional questions, so please, um, you know, we hope that you'll connect with us. Um, and I know um, Mike and Lori are both on um, LinkedIn, so, you know, feel free to reach out and, and ask any of those additional questions that um, we may not have had time to get to. And, you know, on behalf of the Bryan Alumni Association, we want to thank both Lori and Mike for such an excellent presentation, very timely um, in our current situation. And most of all, we want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, to view archived webinars and some of our uh, additional upcoming events, please visit our alumni website, which is alumni.bryant.edu. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.